Hello everyone, welcome to Adobe Creative Cloud Live. My name is Terry White. It's my pleasure to take you through part three of Back to the Basics, getting started with Photoshop, or Back to the Basics with Photoshop, part three, where we're gonna continue where we left off on Friday, talking about the tools. So I see a, a bunch of great people in the room already. Uh, hello, Evil Cerise, Muhammad, Justin, Pearly Cream Cheese, Reggie. Uh, let's see who else. And I think that's it as far as names I see so far. But if I missed your name or didn't scroll up, sorry about that. And we will hopefully catch you on the next one. What's up, Reggie? All right. So, uh, guys, if you missed any part of this, um, this has been going on now. This is, our, like I said, our third one. And, of course, you can always catch the replays here on the Creative Cloud channel. Unfortunately, they're not like in a playlist or an easy way to get to them all. Um, but you can, of course, just search for Back to the Basics and it will uh, hopefully take you to the first one and the second one. And John from the Netherlands, hello. And also, I saw someone from Egypt earlier. Welcome. And let's go ahead and get to it as soon as I silence this device. Hang on one sec. Oh, no, it's taking me through a whole thing. I don't want to go through a whole thing. Agree. Get started. All right, now we can do it. Sorry about this, folks. <laughs> I just don't want this thing beeping while, while I'm talking. There we go. Do not disturb. Okay. So, um, Friday we left off on the tools, and we had only gotten through like most of them, most of the ones that you need to know. In other words, we, we will probably not ever cover all the tools in a basics uh, lesson, because in most cases, people won't ever need all the tools in their basic use of Photoshop. So what I'm doing is I'm going through them and picking out the ones that I know you'll need to know. And, of course, covering those as best I can in the time that we have. We usually keep these to an hour or less. And, again, I wasn't sure how long it would take to do it the first uh, first time. So, uh, for the tools, it took over an hour last Friday because uh, I gave you some examples and we went through a bunch of tools. We got through most of them. We're going to see how many we get through today. And, of course, uh, then we'll pick up with the next lesson next week. So, um, I'm going to try and get these back on track of doing these Mondays uh, here on the YouTube channel until we've got, you know, most of the basics of Photoshop covered. Um, and if the schedule deviates or varies, I will let you know. All right. So with that said, let's go ahead and switch over to my computer. And hello, uh, Nisa, Anissa and Victoria is also in the house and John and Diego and everyone else. Welcome, everybody. All right. So I've got an image open here in Photoshop. I've got several images open here in Photoshop, just a few. And, oh, that's a good one, actually, to start this next one on. Um, I skipped over the paintbrush on Friday because there just wasn't going to be enough time to do it justice. Um, and what I mean by the paintbrush, I mean the, the other tools underneath it. And I said, yeah, you'll kind of need them, but I really didn't go over them because I just ran out of time. Um, but there is one tool in here in particular that I definitely want want you guys to get under your belt. And it's actually a tool that's not used that often. But it's the color replacement tool. So we're going to cover that. But let me cover the regular paintbrush too uh, first. And then we'll uh, get to that. And also if you're an artist. And like I said um, last week someone asked. Uh, was I going to do digital painting? And that's Victoria's. Um, you know that's her specialty. So if you guys want to know more about this tool in particular. She's done like I don't know. A hundred tutorials on the mixer brush tool alone. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and just jump to the brush tool and talk about the brush tool. And you're probably going to say, well, when would I ever use this? And, and I feel your pain. So <laughs> let me explain what it does. The brush tool is literally for painting your foreground color. So my foreground color right now is kind of a burgundy. You can, of course, click on your foreground color and change it to whatever you want. And then when you start painting, um, you, and you're painting in that color. That's what it's for. Um, I am not a painter, so I never, I would say 99% of the time, I'm never using that brush for this. What I'm using this this brush tool for is usually masking or um, when I'm on a layer mask, which we'll get into when we do our whole, whole thing on layers. So while this tool does this, it's just something I never do. That's why I don't spend a lot of time on the brush tool. 
but you will absolutely use the brush tool a lot in other ways. And, we'll, and when we're doing those other ways, um, of course, you'll see what see what I mean. Now, just to point out something, when I made that stroke, I did that on, if we were to look at the layers panel, I know we haven't talked about layers a whole lot yet, but I did that on the background. So that is destructive. That's a bad way to do it. That means I am permanently changing the color of those pixels to that color and not in a good way. And that's just bad, 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 bad. All right, so let me undo it while I still can. And uh, let me go in and show you if you were going to paint over an image, a better way to do it so that you're not painting over the actual image and, and destroying it. Create a layer first, just if you paint on a layer. So now I can say, cool. And now that cool is on layer one all by itself. So it's not, I can move it around. If we switch back to the move tool, I can pick it up. I can do what I want. I did not damage the pixels underneath. So if you are just want to play and paint and maybe create art, then I suggest you do it on layers. That way you're not destroying your background. Now I know people that are artists like Victoria and um, Bert Monroy and a bunch of others, they just open up a blank canvas and go to town with this tool. That's not me. All right. Um, <laughs> but if you are an artist, you could go to town with that tool and paint. All right, enough time on that tool for now. We'll come back to it when the time, um, when we have the other examples that I mentioned. Let me skip over the pencil tool, which you won't be using that a lot. Uh, you will use it if you ever go to Illustrator, though. It's a very cool tool in Illustrator, not a good tool in Photoshop, just because it's just too inaccurate and it's just basically the paintbrush or the brush tool at one pixel at a time. Um, so let's jump to the third one, which is the color replacement tool. This one's kind of really handy. Because what it does is it allows you to change the colors of things that are not black or white. <laughs> what I mean by that is this tool paints and changes the color of the midtones. And when it's when your images or when the area you're trying to change is black or white, there's really no midtone detail for it to change the color of. So it doesn't work on those two colors. But it'll pretty much work on everything else. You may or may not get the color you want you will be close because it depends on what it is you're painting. It's like this is yellow or gold, but it's kind of transparent too because we're seeing the white come through it. So I may or may not get the color I'm looking for. So I'm on this burgundy color once again, and to show you the difference, I'm gonna make my brush a little bit bigger. And now when I start painting with that tool, yeah, see that's not burgundy, it's more pinkish because of how light this original is. Uh, but when I start painting with it, the thing you'll notice is that I don't have to paint within the lines. Look, I'm going over the edge and it's sticking to the edges because there's a secret to any tool that has a plus sign in it. When you use a tool with a plus sign in it, wherever the plus sign is when you first click, that's the color it's changing. So that even when I go over the edge, because the edge is not yellow, it knows to ignore the edge. Now, if I were to go out and start painting outside with the plus sign, outside of the leap, or the um, petal, I should say, then it would start changing um, those other colors as well. So, it's a great tool for what it does, especially when you want to change the colors of things um, with a brush. It's great for that. But keep in mind that you are restricted at least... Um, yeah, for the most part, the way this tool works, it works on the midtones, and you can change the tolerance so it can be more tolerable of color shifts and things like that in the control panel at the top. But that's what this tool does. All right, next up, let's go in and talk about, um, I think that was it, the mixer brush tool. That's a whole different thing. That's an artist tool. We talked a little bit yeah, uh, Friday about the clone stamp tool, and just because we're going down the list, let me do a quick... Uh, nope, not that one. This one. Let me do a quick um, just what the clone stamp tool was doing for us before. Let me bring up my layers panel. I created an extra layer just so that when I clone, I'm cloning on that layer. And I set my clone stamp tool to sample instead of the current layer, which is what it defaults to, to sample all layers. And so that's uh, we want it to be all layers. That way it will sample through the current blank layer down to the bottom. And what this is for, once again, for those of you who missed Friday and just since we're going down the list, um, if I wanted this, this tree stump to be maybe on this side, 
Uh, then what I can do is hold down my option key because I have to hold down my option or alt key to tell it where I want to clone from. And then let's say I want to clone from the upper right corner. Click. Now when I go over here, I position my cursor wherever I want that to start cloning. Um, yeah, wherever I want that to start cloning to. Keep in mind, it's going to be on its own layer, so that's fine. And now it will start cloning that um, stump. And I can see the little plus sign on the stump itself, so that will kind of guide me as to where I am in my cloning process. But this is what cloning is with the clone stamp brush. And it is a brush, so you can clone as much or as little of the area that you want as opposed to making a selection first and then copying that area. And again, because we did that on a layer, now I've got the flexibility to pick that up, move it around, put it wherever I want, put it maybe over there and flip it around, do whatever I want. Here, we can even do things like free transform and we can say flip horizontal. So now it looks like it's leaning on the other side. So it doesn't look like an exact duplicate just yet. And I can do all kinds of cool things. So clone stamp tool um, is specifically for taking part of an image, putting that or duplicating that image, part of that image somewhere else. All right, next, uh, with this, can you recolor your <laughs> pets? It depends on your pet. All right, if your pet's not black or white, you got a shot. All right, um, let's continue on. All right, so we did the... Um, oh, no, we didn't do that one. We did the clone stamp tool. Let's jump down to one of my favorite tools of all time. It is the history brush. So if we switch back to, where was it? The sunflower image, there it is. And I say, oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, I did it on, its, on the background, oops. Now, I could undo, undo, and keep undoing as long as I have enough undos. But if I just, if but undoing, what that means is that you're literally going back a step at a time, um, all the way back to potentially your beginning or how many ever steps you have set in your history. What if I only want to undo part of it? Let's say I don't want to undo all three petals. I just want to undo the middle one. Well, there's no way for me to get to that now. I'd have to undo it all the way back and then paint the other two without the middle, unless I use the history brush. The history brush, as the name implies, allows me to paint back in time. So I can say, you know what, undo, it's like undo on a brush, undo this part. It's not, it's not painting yellow, it's just undoing on a brush. So I can say, you know what, I wanna undo that petal, undo those changes on just that one, but keep the rest. So that's the history brush. I love the history brush because it lets me do just that. I don't want to undo everything. I don't want to undo 20 steps back. I just want to undo part of what I did that I might have missed early on. And I don't want to have to go all the way back. Um, so people like like people always you know tell me I don't use <laughs> I don't use enough layers because I know I've got the history brush. I know if I really messed something up three, four, five steps ago, and I don't want to undo far, that far back, I can always use the history brush to paint out that one mistake. So um, it's just kind of just the way you prefer to work. Of course, I'm not, I'm not saying layers are a bad thing. You should absolutely use layers. Layers are a great thing. Uh, but in case you forgot, like in this case, I forgot to make a layer before I start painting, uh, I know that I could always undo on a brush. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's go on to the eraser tool. And there's a difference. There's a bunch of erasers. Um, I don't use the eraser tool nearly that much anymore because since we have layers and we have masks, there's really not that much reason to do an erase these days. Um, it's rare that you would do an erase. So let me uh, show you an example of what the eraser actually does. Let's go back to that. Uh, nope, not that one, not that one, not that one, that one. Um, so we added that layer, which is that extra stump on the left. I'm turning it on and off so you could see it. Now let's say I wanted to, it's too late to do a history thing because I've 
flipped it around and moved it. I can't now just decide, hey, I want to unstamp part of it because I've gone too far. So if I wanted to physically get rid of those pixels on part of the stump, that's what the eraser is for. So for example, if I zoom in on it and move it around and I can say, you know what, I want to erase this front part, then that's what the eraser literally does. It says, I'm going to remove those pixels for you and they are now gone. So if you wanted to blend that in more with the leaves or maybe make the leaves look like it's more in the front of it, I can erase parts of it to do that. But this is again, one of those destructive things where I'm getting rid of those pixels for good. Like that stump, once I leave this, is, is gone. Like there's no bringing it back. I can bring it back with history. But there's no real bringing it back once I save and close the file. So we don't really erase much in modern Photoshop workflows, but just to show you what this tool does, because there are occasions where you might use it, something that doesn't need to be saved, like you left part of something on a selection, you just want to erase that part off. That's what the eraser's for. But if you're doing work like this, it's better to mask. And we'll do all kinds of masking and talking about that when we get into layers in another segment. All right, now there are other erasers. And again, I don't really use these that much. And I would even say, the, I'm not even gonna bother trying to show you these because we just don't use them as much. They are handy every blue moon, but eh, I can't remember the last time I've used these. So let's skip them. All right, the gradient tool. The gradient tool can, I don't know why I keep wanting to switch out of Photoshop. The gradient tool can be useful uh, for creating um, graduated colors. So for example, if I wanted to, uh, I didn't really pick anything easy, but let's say I wanted to make a selection of the background. So let's do a quick select real quick, real fast. We did, we showed the quick select tool and we talked about that it's the quick select tool, not the accurate select tool. Um, so in this case, it is uh, so not selecting her hair perfectly because that's not what this tool's mission is. It is for doing quick selections. Now that I've got the background selected, I can now switch to that gradient tool. And the gradient tool works between, by default, your foreground and background color, which mine are two dark colors. They're burgundy and black. So if I go ahead and switch that maybe to a brighter color, like a maybe something in that family and click OK. And then I go to the background color, which is currently black. And I were to go to maybe something like that. So I can say I want to see what those two colors look like blended together. So the gradient tool is for just that. I can drag over and it will create a gradient from that lighter color to the darker color. Depending on how far I drag, the tool will determine how smooth or how much the gradient transitions over time. So for example, if I don't drag it, but just a little, then I get a more harsh um, reality. If I drag it from over here to here, then it's more like what I was actually aiming for, where it's light on one side, dark on the other. Uh, you can drag, it, of course, in any direction. You can change this any way you want, top to bottom, bottom up. Uh, ooh, I kind of like that one actually. And you can get your gradients um, in whatever area you want to put them in or whatever selection you want to make them in. So now if I undo, 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 put it back to the way it was, and I were to now create a layer with that selection, now I'm doing it more non-destructively. So remember that this was the one I liked because now I'm putting that on its own layer. So I, I'm not losing my original background, <laughs> which my horrible hair cut out. Um, but I have that now on its own layer and I could refine it and, and make the hair better and so forth and so on. But you get the idea. That's what the gradient tool does. It allows you to blend two colors together. Now there are other options for the gradient tool. So for example, you can use the gradient tool in the sh in different shapes. So instead of one, instead of a linear gradient, <coughs> you could do a radial gradient. Um, so for example, if I do one more new layer and I grab the radial gradient, I am saying do it from the center out. So I drug it um, just a little bit. If I go out from her all the way up, then we kind of get her head like in a spotlight um, or a spotlight behind her, depending on how far out I drag it. There we go. 
So, um, just that's what radial gradient is. And of course, you've got different shapes. I think you, this is what, like a diamond shape. Let's try it. Yeah, like a diamond shape and reflected gradient. Ah, yeah, yeah. Where it's uh, basically putting the light part in the middle. So it looks more like a beam of light. And this one is the diamond gradient. Where it looks like it's in the shape of a diamond. There we go. All right, so those are your gradient tools. And gradients um, are definitely very versatile. I agree, Jan. Let's see, a little mini video tool tips on your browser. Very helpful. Yes, and this is, uh, so the, let's talk about that. This is, um, this is a fairly new CC, I think 2018 feature. And that is, um, what if you forgot what a tool does? Like if you just don't remember what this little funky brush does. It will show you the tool and then it will show you how the tool works. So just like a little video tip. I think we talked about this on day one, but um, it is nice that you can hover over a tool and kind of get a, def a quick definition and a uh, quick review of what that tool does. All right, so now let's move on. Uh, we talked about the sharpen tool um, on Friday. I told you, about, like, for example, if we switch back to our background, deselect, zoom in. Her eyes, her eyes are already pretty sharp, but I showed it on jewelry on Friday and basically just use this tool, a couple clicks will do. And um, oh, I should have probably duplicated that layer. Hold on, let's do that real quick. All right, let's try it again. Just even, even just a little bit there, we see if we zoom in even more, we'll see that before and after. So before, they almost look dull now and they look pretty sharp when I first open them. That's what the sharpen tool does. It just literally sharpens what on a brush uh, versus a filter. Um, underneath the sharpen tool, you've got other tools. You've got the blur tool, which is what it normally defaults to. And you've got the smudge tool. I don't really use the smudge tool much anymore. I used to, um, back in the day. The blur tool, I don't really use much anymore because there's just other ways to do it. But if you were to want to blur or smudge, um, because you can, let me zoom in to her really badly defined hair. Let's go ahead and turn those off. There we go. Um, here, we'll do that maybe to an eyebrow. Um, so what this is doing is it's literally the opposite of the sharpen tool. It's softening the focus on her eyelashes. The more you do it, the more it will do it. So when you let go and do it again and let go and do it again, you've done it you're increasing the amount of blur that you're gonna get. So again, just on the eyebrows there, if we were to go before, much sharper, much cleaner, after. So that was me blurring this area. All right, so that's what the blur tool does. Uh, smudge tool is literally for pushing pixels around. Again, I don't use this a whole lot. Not sure why I'm showing it to you since we're talking about tools you need to know. But hey, you might be in an artistic mood and you want to um, play around with pixels and push them around. Again, on all of these workflows where you're messing with pixels, I highly recommend you do it on a different layer so that way you can always get back to your original. All right, uh, moving on. Dodge, burn, and sponge. Um, the, the, dodging and burning, is a, those are photography techniques that have been around for many, 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 many years. Um, used, to, used to do them in the dark room, but now they are di these are digital equivalents of them. And um, there's a whole technique and process to doing it on a layer versus doing it on the original. But just to show you real quick, uh, let's see. Which one is my clean one now? Okay, that's my clean one. Let's throw this one away. All right, let's duplicate this one. And um, so, dodge, burn, and sponge. So, dodge tool is literally for making an area lighter. Uh, so, if I dodge her forehead or her hair, it all gets lighter, as we can see. So, that's before, after. Now, and this is also going to help make the case when I tell people why you should have a tablet. When I just did it just now, I did it on using the mouse, which is down 
or up. There's no in between. You're either applying the tool or you're not applying the tool. So then if you say, oh, that's too much, it's too light, now you gotta go up and control things like the exposure and, and, and try and change the settings. When you use a tablet, any graphics tablet, I like Wacom, but any graphics tablet that has pressure sensitivity, then you can go in and apply it a little at a time without having to constantly go change the settings. So for example, let's throw that one away. Let's duplicate it again. And um, using my stylus this time, I'm applying it just a little because I'm not pressing down that hard. So here, let me undo, let me throw that away and show you, show you the difference. I'll do it side by side. We'll zoom in. All right, duplicate it again. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to press lightly on the left side, hard on the right side. And uh, here, you guys can see it. So lighter on the left side, just a little bit. Very hard on the right side, just pressing harder on the tablet. So again, uh, before, after, and the left side's not as bright as the right side. So um, this will save you a lot of trips to all your settings and your knobs and your controls to turn turn it down, turn it up, make the brush bigger, make the brush smaller, because all of this, all of that, can be controlled with pressure. All right. Um, that's dodging. Well, what's burning? Burning is the opposite. It's saying, oh, sorry, a sponge. It's saying I want to take an area and make it darker. And what I, where I tend to do this, especially when I'm photographing people and there's a hair light, the part in their hair usually becomes too bright. So what I can do is just simply darken that just a little. Now that's a little too much because I can start to see it on, affect the skin tone. I kind of overdid it. Let's undo that. Let's make the brush smaller. Just darkening, and we'll do it on the left side. We'll darken her hair. So it's like having exposure on a brush. Dodge to make it brighter. Um, okay, I'll get to that in just a second, Jan. Um, darken, or darkening with the burn tool, lightening with the dodge tool on a brush, as opposed to adjusting exposure of a selected area or the entire photo. All right. Next up, um, the pen tool and all the pen tool and all of its variations. I don't use these that much anymore, but they do have some uses for drawing now inside of Photoshop. I remember back in the day, people used to use, the, well, people still do, use the pen tool to make selections. And there are just so many other ways I make selections that I never use the pen tool for that. So the pen tool can either make a selection, it can make a path that you could turn into a selection, it can make a shape that is literally a shape that will be visible and you can see. And when you are on the when you're on any one of these pen tools, you can choose whether or not it's going to be a shape or a path from the very beginning, right here in the menu. Um, that way, you can um, decide what you want. In other words, I want to draw a shape versus make a path to make a selection. So if I want to draw a shape, uh, the pen tool has been around since. Illustrator back in 86, 1986. So I can uh, click and that will plot a point. Now, if I move away from it and click again, that will plot another point and create a line between them. If I click and drag, I'm telling it to make a curve between the next two points, uh, like so. And if I were to click and drag again, and I'm bad at doing this, bear with me. That's going to do a kind of a loop thing there that I don't want, but I can fix it. Yep, that's what I didn't want. Uh, that will give me my curve. And then, of course, I can then click to close it off. Now, my heart looks kind of funky because that point in the middle is, is a curve going in both directions. So what I can do is now use one of the other tools to fix it. I can either convert, um, hang on. I can either convert the point or... I can, yeah, convert tool is the easiest. So I can either say click to convert, and then I can uh, either drag out to control the handles again, or I can just say, you know what? 
let's just fix part of this by holding down my Option or Alt key and control the handles. In other words, break the handle so one bends without bending the other one. So that was holding down the Option or Alt key. Um, and someone asked, I think it was Jan asked, well, what's the difference between the arrow, which is two more tools down, and the move tool. The move tool, as I described on Friday, is for moving layers or objects around. The uh, arrow, which is your um, direct selection tool, <laughs> thank you, tool tip, <laughs> direct selection tool, is literally for working with these paths. So, for example, if I deselect, I can click on one point, and then I can move that point around. That I cannot do with the move tool. The move tool would move the whole object no matter what. So this will let me uh, come in and kind of reshape this a little bit better and get a better looking heart than what I had before. And actually these should be curve points as well. Or this should be a curve point as well. Let's go back to that convert direction point and curve that bad boy out. There we go. All right. So now just in time for Valentine's Day. So now that has become a path if I go down to skip to tools, I can then do what I want with that path. In other words, it's just like you drew a vector path in Illustrator. You can say, I want that to be stroked with a color, which it is right now. I want that to be you know, a different kind of line on it. I want that to be a different kind of weight, the thickness of the color. Um, let's make it smooth. I can also fill it with a color. I can say, you know what, let's fill that with yellow. So you can basically draw with that tool. Um, Paul Tranny's in the house. Hey guys, you guys should follow Paul Tranny's YouTube channel. Paul does a lot of this kind of vector stuff. Uh, he's often on the Facebook page for Illustrator showing people how to create vector art. So his timing's impeccable today because we're doing vectors right now. All right, so that is, um, the, that's the old pen tool. Now there's a newer pen tool. So if that kind of drawing always like you never got it, you were like, oh, I don't understand how this works. There's now a curvature pen tool. This is brand new. So this is like the 21st century version of the pen tool. Um, actually, there's two more. There's the freeform pen tool and the curvature tool. Let's, well, let's do them in order. Let's do the freeform pen tool first. So the freeform pen tool, instead of me clicking and dragging and clicking and or clicking and clicking and dragging, I can basically just draw. And that will create, okay, let's try it again. That'll create vectors with a steadier hand. That's a whole lot faster than what I was doing, but as you can see, the results aren't as accurate, meaning I would now have to massage it to make it better. I would have to get rid of some of those extra points that I don't need, smooth some of those points out with the other tools. But if you are good and you're drawing with a stylus, um, you can really create some quick and cool vector art. So that is the freeform pen tool and that's exactly what it does. Now let's talk about the, uh, the one that's kind of in between. So the pen tool, very structured. The freeform pen tool, not structured at all, do whatever you want. The curvature tool fits nicely in between. So what the curvature pin tool does is it allows me to go in and let's come here and let's say that I want, I do have to click and then I do go to my next point and uh, click or drag. And then it will continue based on what I do. I don't have to, um, I have to define corner and curve points as much as I did with the previous tool. I don't know if, I don't know if I'm explaining that to where that makes sense, but let's say I click and I, I don't know how to drag to make a curve point. So I just basically, it shows me a preview of what my next point's going to be before I click on it. So there it is. Now, when I come over here, I get that preview that I don't get with the pen tool of what's going to happen depending on where I click or let this go. So that's why the curvature pen tool is kind of nicer for things like this, because you get to see that nice preview and know what you're going to get and how it's going to respond, where it's going to be before you let go. You know what you know what your end result is going to be a lot better. And again, any of these can be adjusted after the fact with with your um, 
with your convert point tool. So for example, I can always go in, grab the handles and massage these to my heart's content or make them corner points or curve points as needed, um, depending on what I'm looking for. So those are the pin tools and uh, that is, okay, I'm not sure why, you say, why you're saying I look 10 years younger, 10 years younger than <laughs> Friday. It's a good weekend. All right, anyway, those are your pen tools and all your other tools for manipulating what you've drawn. So uh, these first three are for drawing. The last ones are for, man for manipulating what you've drawn. So if I want to delete a point, like on that one that had too many points, uh, let's go back to this one. Oh, wrong layer. There we go. And I now go in and I can say, uh, hey, you know what? I don't really need that point there. I don't really need these points. This should just really be a straight line with nothing in between. Then I can just click the minus to remove. Oop, that's a bad one. Remove those points out of there. So that's what it's for. Actually, that's a good one. Let's keep that one. Let's get rid of these. And of course, if you left out an area where you needed to add a point, you can add a point by either clicking to make it a corner point or dragging to make it a curve point. So if we go back to that original, this one, and I switch to the uh, plus sign, it gives me a plus sign as I get ready to click on it. So saying, hey, if you click right here, you're gonna add a point to that spot. You click right there, you're gonna add a point to that spot. You can do whatever you want after the fact. All right, so with that um, said, those are your pen tools. And again, today's Photoshop users mostly using them for drawing as opposed to selections. Uh, but there are people that still like using them for selections. I don't know why, but you're out there. All right, let's jump over to my favorite tool. That is the text tool. It's time for a different image though. All right, let's switch to this guy. All right, he just looks like, you know, he's just waiting for, he's telling us summer is coming. Uh, so if I wanted to type the word summer, and by the way, the text tool in Photoshop is probably the third most used tool or the second most used tool and the crop tool is definitely like one or two because this is what people use Photoshop for every single day. They're cropping and resizing images for whatever they need, need them for. And then of course they are um, adding text to images because that's what Photoshop's really good at. So the type tool can be used a variety of different ways. You can just click on an image and start typing. You can click and drag to create a frame for your text. Um, I believe it. There's even text threading now these days, but I, I'd have to look and see. Um, but anyway, let's say that I want to just click here and type the word summer. So I can either, of course, type it in upper or lower case. It will remember my foreground color, whatever my last foreground color is, and that will be my type. Um, it'll also be in whatever font I used last. So all of these attributes, of course, are changeable, editable, and, and changeable. So for example, if I don't like the color, I can highlight this. I can go up here and I can say, you know what? Let's pick a different color. The one thing I love about Photoshop's color picker is that yes, while you can go in here and you can pick different colors that are, you know, whatever color you want in the spectrum, I love the fact that if you move outside of the color picker, you get an eyedropper. So I can say, hey, I want this to be skin tone. I want this to be hair color. I want this to be green trees in the background color. I want this to be whatever, I want this to be jacket color. I want this to be whatever color I want based on the image. Um, you can even drag the eyedropper. There's even a trick to even get it outside of Photoshop and pick something that's in a window behind Photoshop. There's all kinds of ways to use color picking. Of course, if you know the color values, you can just type them in and get the specific color you want. But I love the fact that I can grab any color, whether it's in the spectrum or just a color that I kind of see that I think would be cool for this text, like this pinkish color of whatever these cars are uh, over here. So now that I've got my color selected and click OK. And of course you can change your font. And the nice thing about Photoshop in the last few years, Photoshop CC, we can change our font and see it as we're doing it. 
So Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign all have a unified font menu that pretty much works the same. You have the ability to um, star or check fonts that you use regularly to make them favorites. You have the ability, of course, to twirl down and see the other um, parts of the font family. You have the ability to filter based on typekit fonts, for example, the fonts that come with Creative Cloud. You have the ability to filter on your favorites. You have the ability to filter on um, similar fonts, meaning I type something and I just want to see all the fonts that are like the font I just typed. And that will show me the similar fonts. That's also fairly new. And last but not least, you have the ability to filter based on class. So if I'm looking for a specific type of font, like I'm looking for something that is handwritten, then it will show me my handwritten fonts that I have currently installed. Or if I'm looking for something that is uh, sans serif or serif in this case, then it will show me all my serif fonts. And I kind of saw a Bedini book or whatever this one is, Big Castlin. You know, let's also filter on, on type kit. So Trajan. All right. Orpheus Pro Regular is what I'm going to settle on. All right, and of course, if that has other styles like regular or bold or medium and italic, I can choose those as well. Now, what about size? You can either size this as an object, which sometimes is just faster, or you can give it a specific point size. So for example, if I knew I wanted this to be 45 points, I just type 45, boom, it's 45 points. If I know I want this big, I don't know how many points that big is. I won't know until I see it. Then I'm gonna show you a keyboard shortcut that will just make working with type size a whole lot easier. Uh, if you hold down your command key on the Mac, control key on Windows, and look at what it does. It puts a box around, I'm just tapping the key. It puts a box around the type. And when that box is there, that means, hey, you've got handles now you can size. So I can start pulling this and make this whatever size I want it to be. And I can stretch it or not. If I, hold down, if I start pulling it and hold down the shift key, then that will constrain it to be proportions and not stretch it. So I can say, hey, I want this to be way up here and bigger. Now, I, don't, I now see that's 189.55 points, but it would have taken me a lot longer to get there if I had to keep typing numbers in to guess. All right. Um, of course, you can choose your orientation, or I'm sorry, your justification, left justify, center, right justify. There are other options in the type menu. You can make your type curved. You can do all kinds of, or white warp text. Uh, so you can, for example, choose an arc, and now your text will be on an arc. You can choose an arch. You can choose a, oh, hang on, shell lore. You can choose bold. You can choose flag. You can choose all these different effects, and your text will still be editable in this um, with, with the warp on it. Fish eye is kind of cool. And of course, uh, squeeze, squeezing those budgets, twist. And with any of these, you can of course change their attributes by choosing uh, the different options for that particular effect. All right, so now that I've got my summer there, oh wow, I was right, I know. Um, text always creates a layer first. So now that's on its own layer, which is great. So if I switch back to my move tool, I can pick it up, move it around, put it wherever I want it to be and, um, work with it that way. And of course I can always go back in and edit. So for example, if I want to, um, edit it, I can just go back to the type tool and I can just click and start editing my type. So if I want to say summer and Instead of summer, I want to say spring. Now I've said spring. Um, and of course, that just changes. the. It also names the layer, whatever it is you type, so it's easier to see which one's which. Uh, so typing um, text in Photoshop is very easy. I remember type, editable type didn't get added till Photoshop 6, like back in the 90s. Uh, you could always add type, but it was in pixel format. And once you added it, like once you type spring and clicked OK, that was it. You couldn't change it. It was no longer editable. So once type became editable, it was, and you used to have to type into a dialog box. You couldn't see it on the canvas until you clicked OK. Anyway, um, you kids don't appreciate what you have now. <laughs> Just kidding. 
All right, so anyway, we've got our spring there in the font we want. And of course, if you want to type more text, you can. Um, it will remember your last setting, so don't be alarmed when you click. You're going to get that nice big cursor in whatever font and color you were last in. And um, this will be the spring of all springs because... And then, of course, once you're finished typing, you have to tell Photoshop you're finished by acknowledging or committing to it. Then that becomes a new layer, which you can move around. Um, let's just try to change the, change the location of these. There we go. So now I'm getting back into the whole design and space and where things should be. But anyway, there you go. All right. Next up, we have... Um, before we finish on type, I just want to point out you have additional type two tools. You have the horizontal type tool, which is the one you're going to use by default, but you also have a vertical type tool. What the vertical type tool does is just as the name implies, it just automatically types it up and down for you. Uh, so instead of you having to hit a letter, return, hit a letter, return, hit a letter, return, it will just do this uh, vertical effect for you. And... I don't know, sometimes that's useful for things where you want to make a design. And of course, um, if the layer is selected, so I've got vertical selected, and if I switch to the type tool, I don't necessarily have to highlight the type to make changes. So for example, I could say that, hey, I want that to be in a different color. Let's go ahead and grab that, that yellow or maybe that skin tone. There we go, something like that. Oh, no, I kind of liked it better that way. There we go. And um, I didn't have to highlight it first to do that. And also don't have to highlight it first to change the font. So if I want to change the font from bold to maybe italic, then it's italic instead of bold just by being able to change it without having to highlight first. So as long as the layer is selected, as long as you're in the type tool, either type tool, it will make those changes to the layer that is selected, even if you don't go and highlight the text. So you don't have to highlight the text every time is what I'm trying to say. If your font, and this one does, if you're using an open type font, which all the Typekit fonts are, and the designer of your font has created additional um, glyphs for your font, then you will be able to go in and see those glyphs in Photoshop based on the selection you make. So if I select the letter G, I get more Gs. I get the ability to change the G that I got by default to a different G. And all it did was just change a little swoosh on the end of it to be uh, higher or lower or stick up instead of sticking down. So I didn't say that you will love all the glyph choices. <laughs> I mean, it just, it depends on who designed the font and what choices they gave you. So this one's very basic, minor little changes to each character. Um, some have none, some have a ton. So it just depends on the font. So for example, um, here, let's drag out a frame first. And let's type in the word Bickham. Bickham. I don't know if it's I am. Bickham script. Bickham script pro um, is one of my favorite script fonts to show this feature off because it has a ton of glyphs. It's Big Ham. Got it. Big Ham. H A. All right. So here, let's uh, make this bigger, make this bigger, and let's talk about the glyphs inside Bickham Script Pro. The reason this is one of my favorites is for, um, because you can just really design some really cool looking logos and things because there's so many different glyphs inside here. So if I highlight that one, okay, that gives me a, a different giant B. Uh, but if I highlight the letter T, for example, if 
I can get to the letter T. Hold on. Actually, excuse the hand tool, move over. And go back to the type tool. There we go. Look at how many T's there are. So some will have one or two or three or none. Some will have a dozen different glyphs and different ways you can um, choose a different character. And all I'm doing is highlighting the character and that little menu pops up and then I'm clicking on the one I want to try. And that gives me um, that particular kind of, uh, that particular kind of uh, T on the end. So here are all my different M choices because I highlight the letter M. So these are called alternate glyphs and the alternate glyphs um, come in really handy when you're doing design work. If you're just typing everyday text inside of an image, probably won't ever use alternate glyphs. But if you're really trying to spice up your design and do something that no one else has done or no one else has because they don't know they can do this and they're just going to type the basic letters, uh, then you will give your client something that um, no one else is going to give them, even if they use the exact same fonts. All right, so that is working with type. From a basic standpoint, of course, uh, like I said, all of these are layers and you can do whatever you want with them after the fact, including hiding them or throwing them away if you choose to. All right, next up, um, we talked about this tool a second ago. This is your direct selection tool. And we did that when we were doing the different pin shapes. If we remember, if we go back to our bubblegum girl, I think she's over here. Dun, 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 dun. There she is. Oh, and I oh here I got rid of them. But anyway, if you were to um, just real quick, if we go back to that curvature pin tool or freeform tool for that matter, and we were to draw our shape, and we were to then of course make that shape thicker. Now the uh, direct selection tool is literally for working with um, this object. So I can either directly select the uh, points on this particular object and move them around or adjust the curve handles. Or if I deselect and select the entire object, Sorry, path selection. If I select the entire object with the path selection tool, then I can move the entire object around. So you have two different pointers here. These are not move tools. Well, they are move tools for vectors, but you have the move tool for moving your layers and image, the pixel-based images around. You have your um, direct selection and path selection tools for moving your vectors around. And so that's what these two pointers are for. All right, while we're on, well, we might as well do it while we're here. Um, you also have uh, define geometric shapes. So if you want it to um, draw a box inside of a Photoshop, it's just much easier than using the pen tool to draw four lines. Just draw a box. If you want to draw an ellipse, you have the ability to draw an ellipse using the ellipse tool or one with rounded corners or basically all of the geometric shapes here are pretty self-explanatory and you even have a line tool. So you can say, hey, don't, don't chew gum in class. All right, next up. Um, is the custom shape tool. And this is kind of one of those hidden gems inside Photoshop because when you go to this tool, you have literally dozens, if not a hundred different custom shapes to pick from. So I'm up in the menu where it says shape right there. And I'm just dropping down this menu to see all of these various shapes. What this saves me from having to do is draw these from scratch. So instead of me struggling trying to draw a heart, there's a heart right there. I can just use that one. Or if I need a particular shape that's here, I can grab one. So if I'm looking to use to talk about the world, the World Wide Web, I can choose that one. And now when I pull it out, I get the web shape. If I hold down the shift key, it will give me the um, perfect, perfect shape without being stretched. And of course, you can um, choose any shapes you want at any given time. So if I need an arrow, Instead of me trying to make one with the line tool, I've now got an arrow. I don't have to worry about drawing it from scratch. So the custom shape tool is really, really handy when you're trying to illustrate a photo or trying to put things on a photo that um, 
would be hard to draw or take more time to draw. So that each sentence is filling the width, making sure it really fits. Um, Jan, I, I'm asking a question, who, meaning, oh, you mean how, okay. <laughs> All right, it's like, what do you mean who? All right, this question is, how do I put text so it's just basically like confined to a, a shape or a box? And um, the, there's really, because although, there's a, um, a shape or text area, you know, that Photoshop has. It's really not like a frame like Illustrator and Photoshop has. So, for example, we just switch to a different image here. Um, I can click and type as we've been doing, or I can click and drag. And that will create a frame that, here, let's get out of a script. Uh, let's just go back to serifs. And, um, if I type now, that will kind of constrain it to that box that I just drew. And of course I can make it smaller so we can see it all. So if that's what you're trying to do, that will do it. And you have the option of course of resizing that frame whenever you want. So if I go back to my type tool, that frame is still there. So I can say, hey, I wish this were wider and it will make it wider. If I wish it was shorter, it make it shorter. So that's the closest thing to a frame is just simply taking the text tool and dragging it out to the area that you want to type in. And it will try to confine it to that area as best it can. It's not nowhere near as sophisticated as the frame tools inside of Illustrator and uh, InDesign. All right, next up, um, back to our tools. So we did the custom shape tool. We did the hand tool, I think earlier in a lesson, uh, but just a reminder, the hand tool is for panning your image around. So I'm not moving the image. I'm not using the move tool. I'm just moving my view of the image. So I want to move up here where I can see it at the top. I can always zoom out. And by the way, the hand tool only works when you're zoomed in. Like it's not moving anything now because there's no reason to move. I can see everything. It's not panning. But the minute I can't see everything, then the hand tool works. And of course, the quickest, easiest way to get to the hand tool temporarily no matter what tool you're on. So if I go back to the type tool, um, actually any tool but the type tool. If I go to any tool but the type tool, um, because you could, the keyboard shortcut is the space bar. So if you run the type tool, it might assume you're typing a space. Hold down the space bar, that lets me move around, let go of the space bar, I'm right back to the tool I want it to be on. So space bar is the best keyboard shortcut for moving around in an image quickly without having to constantly Go back and forth between the hand tool and the tool you want to be on. And of course, the zoom tool, and we're right at the top of the hour, so this is perfect. The zoom tool is for zooming in. So you can either click and do it the old way we used to do it, or click and drag and do it really fast um, because this is all GPU accelerated. So it takes advantage of your graphics processor uh, to really zoom in at a nice speedy clip. So I don't have to click, 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 or option or alt click to get out of it. I just simply click and drag down to zoom in or drag out or diagonally up to zoom out. And of course, uh, once you're zoomed in, space bar, move around, zoom, space bar, move around, zoom, space bar, move around. So that is it for part three of the tools you'll need to know when working with the basics inside Photoshop. Now, we have a lot more things to cover as far as basics are concerned. So next week, we'll I think we'll probably get into layers um, because we've been dabbling with them, but we will really get into layers, adjustment layers, layer masks, um, all the layer groups, all the different things you'll do with layers uh, from a basic standpoint. And with that said, um, that's it. Thanks for watching, everybody. And hopefully you got something out of this. And I've been kind of monitoring the uh, chat. And uh, I think I got all the questions. But if I didn't, um, go ahead and type it in and I'll try and get to it. If not, um, save your question for next Monday and we'll answer it then. All right, cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Uh -huh.